the first John Hayes Award was launched. And the first colleague who said this John Hayes Award was from Hello. We have to say that since that time, a huge amount of download of this article has been observed on the Journal of Writing Research website. So I think it's not a side effect, this is a related direct effect of this winning prize. So I'm very honored to introduce Ron Kellogg for the first John Hayes lecture. It is a very special pleasure for me. <coughs> not only because of his important and strong scientific contribution to writing research, but also because he is the first with whom I collaborated with after my PhD. Ron Kellogg made his PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder under the supervision of Professor Walter Kinch. Then, he had postdoctoral training at Stanford University. After his postdoc, he moved to Missouri University of Sciences and Technology as assistant professor, and then he finally held the position of full professor. A few years ago, he moved to St. Louis University, still in Missouri, where he has been head of the Department of Psychology. Something important for him for writing research he is now a full professor only. He has done all his administrative activity, and so we can hope that we will be able to read more and more papers from him. Ron Keller is the author of The Psychology of Writing, in which he presents his personal view on writing. If you haven't read this book, I usually Consider, advise you to read this book because it is an important book. Everything we are doing in writing research can be found in that book. He is also the author of two very well known books in the United States, more especially, especially two textbooks. The one is Cognitive Psychology, and the second is The Fundamentals of Cognitive Psychology. You all know the scientific contribution about cognitive effort and processing time of the writing process, about the role of working memory in writing, and about how writers reach writing expertise. I want to underline something. In all his articles and chapters, one cannot integrate major theories and findings from general cognitive psychology and psycholinguistics. This is fundamental for writing research because integrating such references strongly contributes to establish writing research in the field of cognitive psychology. To be sure and to conclude, I want to repeat again my pleasure to introduce Ron Kellogg for this John Hayes lecture and I take this opportunity to thank him for having accepted this is just a personal note some years ago to collaborate with an unknown student. So, thank you all, and it's no time to listen to you reporting or some funding on working memory in writing. Thank you. 
to the solving of the content and rhetorical problems that the writer faces. Working memory, the transient storage of information so that it's accessible immediately in conscious awareness and just outside of conscious awareness, is most critical to those second and third points. Uh, the accessibility and the ability to manipulate and apply that knowledge. We're most interested in going back to the original Flowers and Hayes model, thinking of uh, planning processing of, of conceptual content, the translation of those ideas into text, and reviewing ideas in text in a knowledge transforming text. We're interested in young adults primarily who are at least at the beginning stages of beginning to change what they think as a result of what they write, where there's very extensive interaction between at least these two components. So that's sort of the framework of where we we're coming from. Badley's well-known model of working memory seemed well suited for helping us to understand this. In the left hemisphere of the brain, there's a parietal lobe region that is supporting the storage of those representations, and the frontal lobe region, including the brocus area, for allowing the person to sub-vocally articulate the inner voice that we have in the composition. Surprisingly, though, as you can see, uh, the left hemisphere is involved in uh, the visual codes of the visual spatial sketch pad, where it's the right hemisphere that's involved in the locations, the spatial representations. The executive network I described, one important area is the anterior cingulate gyrus in the frontal lobe, as well as the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, these are very important components then of the executive attention network. And we won't talk about these other two, but as you can see, it's actually part of a complex coordination of attentional systems that the brain is employing. Now, our interest then was to try to understand how do these map onto uh, composition. And we expect it to be complicated. And as you can see, it is. This is the proposal of the 1996 chapter uh, based on a fairly limited amount of research that we had at that time on how these three components of Badley's model supports uh, composition. We anticipated the visual spatial sketch pad was primarily involved with planning, and I'll say more about exactly when later. The phonological loop is very important in reading of the information that's well established from a variety of studies in, in reading, and critically, the phonological loop is involved in the translation then of ideas into the text. This is the transcription component. And uh, I go back to Don Galen's work on how programming is a really crucial part of the motor execution. We believe that it's actually the programming aspect of handwriting or typing that is drawing upon this attentional resource of the central executive. But notice, too, that so do all of these other components. So if I could sort of simplify this diagram for you and do it this way, which shows you that the central executive is really supporting everything except those actual motor movements themselves. And the visual space, spatial sketch pad is limited to planning, whereas the phonological loop should uh, be observable in translation and in uh, reading. That model is now 16 years old, so the central question that I'd like to address today is how is it faring in its adolescence? Uh, as we all know, adolescence is a very trying time for we human beings. And uh, I would like to leave you with the message that it's the same is true of scientific models, at least my model. Uh, it has gone through a lot of uh, pains. So let's take a look at what's supported and what's been rejected. First, there's been very interesting lines of work that really circumscribes what the role would be for a short-term working memory. And one of those is that if you have a very high degree of domain knowledge, then you can simply circumvent that. You can carry out the processing that you need within working memory uh, in a long-term school. And the concept of long-term working memory then has been one major limitation of where we need to be concerned about short-term working memory. 
A second is that we know, and I think this is consistent with the knowledge usage principle I outlined earlier, that there are very important individual differences in writer's ability that has nothing to do with working memory capacity. And one example is uh, the study showing that the advantage that young girls have over young boys doesn't seem to relate at all to working memory scores. It has instead to do with their superior language skills. So that has certainly put boundary conditions on the application of this model. The one feature that has stood the test of time is this argument that the central executive is crucial to the process of writing and that it is being demanded by all of these processes. Uh, one form of evidence comes from some of our own work that compared relevant speech making decisions about a relevant speech where there's a bit of executive attention plus the phonological loop or a very heavy load on uh, both of those components by retaining six random digits while a person tries to generate a sentence. And we have a series of experiments where we've replicated the no-load control condition in each case and as you can see, on uh, experiment one, you get some decrement in the sentence length from just a load on the phonological loop. But that is enhanced when you then add a minimal load on the central executive. And notice that it's pretty devastating in terms of its effect when you have a heavy load on both of those components. Another example is to look at individual differences. And this is a study from uh, Vandenberg and Swanson looking at whether they can predict performance on a standardized test of writing uh, by using uh, measures that capture individual differences in phonological loop storage, visual spatial sketch pad storage, or central executive capacity. So they administer a battery test, perform a factor analysis, and in fact confirm a nice fit to the model that there are these three components that are measured in their individual differences. They then uh, regress that on writing performance. And the key feature is that what stands out in every one of these processes is the central executive factor. So that the beta waves are significant for those, but not for the other two. So this confirms the idea that the central executive seems to be the primary component that is drawn upon as the model that it, that it did. Now, the fact that these are not reliable does not mean that the phonological loop is not important, for example. Remember, these are just looking at individual differences. And it doesn't mean that a writer has a very low degree of phonological storage is not using that storage to actually compose. To get at that, we need to do experiments to manipulate the availability of that component. And one of the best examples of that is a study uh, by Chenoweth and Hayes, who went beyond some earlier research with irrelevant speech by using uh, articulatory suppression, where the individual has to repeat a word, tap, in this experiment, on a regular basis to interfere with the phonological loop. And the question is, would that then disrupt the translation ability? Importantly, uh, the work uh, included a control condition of um, a motor movement of tapping the foot in addition to this vocalization, which allowed them to demonstrate that it's the phonological representation rather than simply having to make a concurrent response. It was a very elegant design in ruling out that alternative explanation. And so the question that was raised here is to what extent is translating then um, involving the phonological loop in that experiment. And the results are shown here. Uh, they were able to show that if you look at the length of words in the T verse of a pause, uh, a, ver a, a language verse followed by a pause, that um, you get a reliable decrement when they have to vocalize um, the word tap repetitively. And notice that you don't get it when they're not vocalizing, when they're using the foot tap. So that confirms the, the, 
the model's prediction. But secondly, we do something very interesting. Uh, if you go back now and look, uh, it's also possible, excuse me, it's also possible that it was reading that was important in this task because it's possible that what is causing the problem is that they're reading the text and that's also using the form of the loop. So I very much like that the design included an invisible writing condition where they could not see the text and that eliminated the possibility of them reading. So you're able to now isolate it to just the translated process. So this, I think, provides for us a nice paradigm of how to do a well-controlled experiment that tests these assumptions in a, in a very specific way. Now, for things that haven't turned out as well. Another paper uh, that Hayes and Genoa uh, raised the question of whether it's really the case that editing uses only the simple executive, but does not use the phonological loop. So they applied the very same rationale. They included articulatory suppression. But here people did a very simple task of transcribing texts. They weren't composing sentences. They were simply copying uh, a, a, a written text. Then they wanted to know the editing process of that, of what was corrected, what wasn't corrected, as they're doing that transcription. So the measure that you have would be on uncorrected errors. And what the findings show is that articulatory suppression uh, incremented the number of uncorrected errors. In other words, the editing process was being disrupted as a consequence. That means that editing then, in fact, seems to be using this same phonological loop, contrary to the model's predictions. And it's quite consistent across trials. In fact, it even grows across trials. However, uh, there is one possibility, and that is that it wasn't really editing that was being involved there, but rather reading it. And it would be very interesting if there's an experiment just waiting to happen, as far as I know it hasn't been done, to include the invisible writing condition as a way of further testing that, that difference. If the effect goes away under invisible writing, then in fact it wasn't the editing process, it was the reading process that was making use of this resource. So what I'd like to try to get across is that we have now methods, and these nicely illustrated, for being able to provide precise answers to these questions. Now what we've done is try to uh, look a little more detail at two things happening at once where we're interested in trying to double associations between planning and linguistic encoding. We wanted to find something to manipulate planning on the one hand and linguistic encoding on the other, where that refers to all of these components taken together, uh, more than just grammatical encoding, but uh, orthographic encoding in the case of writing. So we're interested in looking now at both of these top two lines simultaneously. And the idea uh, with Thierry and Andy Fiala was to use the standardized one-back working memory task, where people are being interrupted by doing a secondary task. And we look at interference in the performance of that task, uh, and whether it requires one of these components depends on exactly how you design the task. So here's an example of involved verbal, where the person sees syllables presented uh, on the screen as they're writing sentences. And we've done this with text composition, or just single sentences. And uh, they have to detect whenever the target, uh, whether the stimulus that's occurring now was identical to the one that occurred before. If it's new, then it's a target, and they're supposed to, to indicate a response. If it's the same, then they just maintain it in working memory until they find a target. So it's requiring people to maintain things in working memory and update them. In this case, it's verbal working memory. We have other versions of this where it's spatial or visual by using shapes rather than verbal stimuli, or they're responding to left or right, depending on uh, in, this, in the spatial version. And what we get, what we predicted was that it doesn't matter what kind of words we use as the prompt for subjects to compose their sentences uh, for verbal working memory, because our argument was that verbal working memory 
phonological loop ought to be a resource for any kind of translation. So we gave people, um, in this case, a definition task, where they simply had to define a word, and we varied whether that word was abstract or one that was concrete to create a visual image. And what we predicted was that the concrete words would interfere with the planning process only for those uh, on the visual task. And as you can see, that interaction was obtained where there's even higher interference in the performance of the task um, than the verbal, only for concrete items. So this was exciting to us that we can now begin to isolate you know, what kind of language is making use of the planning process by drawing on a visual spatial sketch. The second experiment uh, replicated that effect, as you can see here. We also then assess the spatial working memory having a component. And at least in these results, it seemed not to at all that these were actually dissociable from one another. It's only visual with being tapped by the concrete language. Critics, reviewers, you know how they are, didn't quite buy all of that until we demonstrated that maybe it's not really the concrete abstract dimension but it's simply that you're varying the lexical property of words and that you can manipulate any kind of lexical property and get the same results. So we tried that with high frequency versus low frequency words and as you can see it made absolutely no difference at all in that case. So this at least confirms our, our interpretation of those original studies. The last thing we did with this experiment though was we looked further at the spatial working memory component. And as you can see, uh, in two experiments now that are summarized here, it appears that it's almost as involved in the sentence writing process as is visual working memory. So here we have, a, I think, a, a dilemma uh, in understanding Badley's model and these specific components uh, because we have very conflicting results for this dimension. Some have reported uh, measurable demands. Others have reported null results. Uh, what I'd like to suggest is possibly going back to an earlier paper that had argued that it really depends on the kind of task that is being uh, uh, done by the individual that could determine to the extent to which spatial working memory is being uh, brought into play. So that is, again, uh, an indication that we have a long way to go to fully understand uh, these support mechanisms. Uh, what I'd like to conclude with is the last set of, of studies. What we've tried to show so far, then, is that very good support for the idea that the central executive is central to the composition process. That phonological uh, loop or verbal working memory is supporting the translation process. It's supporting the reading process, possibly supporting the editing process as we've indicated, uh, which would be in conflict with the earlier predictions of the model. We've even been able to then tease apart planning with concrete words versus abstract words. So we were getting rather pleased with ourselves that things were becoming comprehensible, that we could separate planning from grammatical encoding or linguistic encoding, and we could begin to understand how to, how to manipulate these things in our tasks. So, with that in mind, we designed the last experiment and have discovered that we have a long ways to go before we fully understand this. And let me just share with you the results. What we thought we'd do is try to find another way to manipulate planning. And so we had people use unrelated prompts that they used to create a sentence. Uh, a variety of evil don't have much semantic connection with one another. Or highly related table chair. All the person has to do is take those two words and initiate the sentence, complete the sentence. But while they're doing that, we have them try to retain six random digits or to retain six visual spatial symbols that couldn't be verbally encoded. And um, we then also manipulated the grammatical encoding domains, not just planning, but also grammatical encoding. How do we do that? Going back to a very large literature showing that passive sentences are more complex uh, in 
Chomsky's original ideas of, of there being a transformation from an active kernel to a passive sentence, in more recent views, there being a move operation that results in this, this production of a passive sentence, we expected that passives would involve more computation and would place more demands on verbal working memory as a consequence. And so that was our, our attempt to, to have a separate manipulation for each stage of the process. The design shown here, importantly, everything that we used in the nouns was highly concrete, high imageability. So we were hoping that everybody was having to use imagery, but they have to work at it a lot harder for the unrelated nouns. They have to hold them in their visual spatial store longer to find some connection between those two nouns. And then uh, we'll simultaneously carry on this sort of task. Our manipulation seemed to work really well in the sense that it did what we expected it would. If we look at just the sentence lengths, we anticipated and found that the passive sentences were requiring a lot more work and they were longer sentences as a consequence. So the triangle data up here is statistically greater than the circles. Second, the blue uh, related items were also um, generating shorter sentences than the unrelated items. They had to produce more lexical items to connect those in terms of the uh, idea they were trying to express. So those differences are all allowed for you know, the two main effects that you see. So everything looked good. So then we looked at the working memory performance with very expert specific expectation of what we find, and it was completely unlike what we'd expect. Let me begin. First, it was the active sentence that produced the greatest decrement in their ability to do the digit task and to do the symbol task. The active sentence, not the passive sentence. So what I'm showing you here is just the mean accuracy of performing these. I'm not showing interference scores we first assessed you know, the, the control data, everybody's the same on all those, so I'll just show you the straight comparison here. And you can very, you can very clearly see that people are uh, much worse in the actual sentences and it's a nice main effect in both cases. Second, we expected that it would be the unrelated items that would put the greatest load on working memory, but in fact, it's the related items that are putting a bigger load on the human. Another surprise is we thought that would happen with the visual spatial task. It's happening with the verbal task. Well, this was a very long fall, a very long winter, as our lab group puzzled over this and tried to figure out what might possibly be going on. And here's what we've come up with. We finally concluded that maybe there's a dynamic of the composition of the sentence that's very different for related passive sentences. That the planning of the sentence for a related item means that you might take a table and chair and have an integrated unit that you send forward to grammatical encoding simultaneously as one integrated unit. With unrelated items, maybe you're thinking bride, uh, the bride was at the wedding and an eagle flew overhead. Well, that and the eagle flew overhead can be dealt with much later. You don't have to send both of those items forward into working memory. The same thing might be happening with passives. We can sort of string out the composition process for a passive sentence, whereas an active sentence requires us to have our act together before we actually initiate the grammatical encoding. So this is kind of the logic of what we were thinking might have happened. So what we did was say uh, to our uh, 92 students who volunteered to help us with this project to rate all of these sentences that people had produced as to the degree to which the words in the sentence were integrated into one mental image or idea. And what we were hoping for then was that would provide a metric of the extent to which the planning had already been done in advance before the composition began. And we found a modest, reliable agreement performance, and we, in fact, were able to demonstrate the kind of separation that we thought might account for those early data. 
that in fact uh, the active sentences uh, Yeah, so if we compare uh, related items uh, in, the, in the blue, uh, it's the active sentences that show a higher degree of integration in a single image. And you see the same effect down here. It's not terribly large, but it is a reliable difference. If you then compare active and passive, uh, the, um, where you're, you're holding constant now the relatedness, so that uh, active related versus passive related, for example, uh, you can see that that's a substantial difference, and you just find the same difference occurring here. So, more work to be done on this, but we're anticipating that maybe the explanation is that there's a dynamic composition that's going on. The more fundamental point is that we're a long ways from understanding how working memory fully supports writing if we can get effects of showing verbal working memory is being manipulated by the planning process itself. Relatedness is affecting verbal working memory. And we're also surprised, again, about the active-passive difficulty showing up on both verbal and visual-spatial working memory. So the first conclusion is that possibly two unrelated nouns are being forwarded as a single entry unit. And thus, that could explain how relatedness could possibly impact verbal rather than visual working memory. The second conclusion is that active sentences demand more working memory sources to produce as well as to comprehend. Active sentences, uh, uh, or rather to produce, it's, it's a misprint, it's the passives that require more resources to, to comprehend, but it's the active sentences that it requires more resources to actually produce. Uh, so active sentences interfere more with both of those tasks. That could possibly be because it's interfering with the central executive primarily. Or it could be that it's really drawing on both of those stores of verbal, of verbal and visual spatial working memory. What I think is relevant to a practice here is that we often instruct students to write an active voice in English. And style manuals recommend that people write an active voice because they're easier to comprehend. Our data is showing that those are a lot harder to produce. It demands more resources to produce them. And maybe that's why we have to push people so hard to write an active voice. That these data are the first, to my knowledge, that show that there's actually a heavy cost to trying to produce an active sentence. So, in terms of progress, uh, like many adolescents, the model stands chasing by outcomes. Um, and um, while it is right about some matters, it was wrong about others. Uh, what I think is most important is we now have methods for explicitly testing these assumptions. And by attaining some maturity of this, is going to take some time. Well, I think we're a long ways from having a full answer to it. So thank you very much for your attention.